Hey, what's up, everyone? Mike Myers here with the Song Rang for Guitar podcast, episode number one, Frank Turner. Now, Frank Turner is a fantastic folk punk singer-songwriter from the UK. Over the course of several years, he's released eight solo records, including just a new split he's done with NoFX called West Coast vs. Wessex. This episode, we get into all of it. We talk about technique, we talk about the voicings that he chooses, his inspiration, and the fact that he just celebrated the 25th hundred show with his band, The Sleeping Souls, this past week. So here we go, let's get into it. Episode number one, Frank Turner. Um, so I, I really would love to know, you know, when it comes to songwriting and writing songs, there's always a reason behind it. At what point in your life did you go like, this is something I want to do? Was there something that inspired you greatly to just like start communicating through songs? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I definitely had this light switch moment in my life when I fell in love with rock and roll music, using the, that in the broadest sense of the term. Because the first band I fell in love with was actually Iron Maiden, funnily enough. Um, uh, prior to that, you know, I was sort of vaguely aware of the existence of modern music, I guess. My parents listened to church music and stuff, but I heard an Iron Maiden record and it blew my mind. So um, I was interested. Which album did you, uh, uh, did you discover? That was Killers was the oh, first Iron okay. Maiden record I got. Yeah. Um, I loved it. I mean, I hesitate to say that I was thinking about songwriting, per se, at that time. It was more just kind of like the sound, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, another really formative moment for me was when I got into Nirvana, particularly in utero. And the reason I mentioned in utero is that, um, you know, I was playing in a kind of garage band with some friends of mine. And this is when I'm like sort of 12, 13 years old. And, you know, we loved ACDC and Iron Maiden and stuff like that and Metallica. And we couldn't really make noises like that. You know, you get the, you get the chord book, but we, we weren't good enough players and we didn't have good enough guitars and amps and drums and stuff. And then we got in utero and it was like, wow, we can play this. You know what I mean? We can, I'm not saying yeah. we can write it, but we can play it. And that was quite a kind of liberating punk rock moment for me. Not that I would have used that terminology at the time. Um, and then like in that kind of garage band, I mean, I did songwriting at that point in my time, but like, again, it's slightly um, off to actually use that terminology. What I would quite often do, we'd rehearse at the weekends and during the week, I'd kind of write out charts of like four random chords that I'd play as power chords and then a bunch of kind of random teenage bullshit that I would shout over the top of it. And hey, presto, you got a song. And like, I seem to remember we'd have like eight new songs every week and never go back to any of them. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, this was all kind of, um, kind of skirting around the issue. Do you know what I mean? I got into stuff like um, first Counting Crows record was huge for me. Um, you know, talking talk about songwriting, I mean, I was into um, uh, kind of early Radiohead stuff I was really into when I was a kid as well. I still am, I should say. Um, but I, I definitely had a kind of moment of transition in my life when, it, and you know, I started playing hardcore bands and punk bands and stuff. And, and I'm very proud of all the music we made. But again, I wasn't really thinking about songwriting as an art. You know, I was writing lyrics to go over riffs and the, the resultant concoction would be roughly three minutes long. Um, but it wasn't really until like in my early 20s when I was touring with uh, a band called Million Dead endlessly, I kind of got a little tired of listening to hardcore and playing hardcore and playing with hardcore bands. And I started listening to a lot of kind of, I guess the broadest term would be roots music, but, you know, folk and country, stuff mm -hmm. like um, the acoustic end of Springsteen, uh, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, um, a lot of kind of 70s country stuff, that kind of thing. And that was the moment when like songwriting as a thing unto itself really kind of started to grab me. Um, the other, the only other band really to mention is an honorable mention would be Weezer, who I think um, I love Weezer. Um, oh, I God, particularly, yeah. yeah, their first, their first three records are flawless to me. And um, you know, I think even though, as I say, I hadn't really started thinking about songwriting specifically, there was something about Weezer that's so militantly simplistic that it focuses you on the song. You know what I mean? It's like as much as I love Dillinger Escape Plan, if it's in thirteen time and it goes at four hundred miles an hour, it's a Dillinger song. And you kind of can't really argue with it. Um, whereas, you know, a Weezer song, like the drums are so simple, the chords are so simple that you have to concentrate on the song because that's all that's really left once you strip all the rest of it away. So that was a band that made me think about that too ahead of time. I, I completely agree with the Weezer reference. I, I listened to an interview with Rivers where he talked about how he writes solos. And he said, you know what? I don't pick up my guitar for solos. I, I, I find that, you know, because I'm locked into the same thing I play. So I just take a mic and I sing into it. And then I pitch shift it up and then I grab my guitar and figure out what to play. That's, that's I, actually went, really cool. 
he was like, I just want it to be melodic. And the and you know yeah. how you mentioned starting out, you know, I, I I feel the same way. And I feel like a lot of people do when writing songs starting out younger, you listen to things like Led Zeppelin and you can have appreciation for classic rock, but there's something where you're like, shit, I can't do that. It's just like it's yeah. another level. But then suddenly, you know, for me, when I heard like Dookie from Green Day, I was like, wait a minute. I think I could do that. You know, I, yeah. I don't know how to, the process of writing a song, but I think I could hammer out some chords and right. I think I could write some stuff over that. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the unspoken assumption in everything I've been saying so far is that I do have at root some kind of platonic ideal of what constitutes a song or songwriting in my mind, you know, and there's something about, it's an art form that tends to be between sort of, let's say two and six minutes long. And, and it sort of has kind of certain traditional structures which you can f mess around with and break and all the rest of it, but they still exist. And it's about a relationship between kind of root chords and top line melody and lyrics and about how you bring those things together structurally and conceptually and all the rest of it. And that's the thing about being into more kind of riff based music when I was younger is it, it you know, looking back, I can see that some of those songs definitely are kind of like songwriting pieces of music. And to Sandman is a great song. It's written as a song, you know, but like a lot of kind of like, particularly because I got into a lot of kind of quite techy, weirdo, hardcore, like um, Converge and Botch and stuff like that. I love all those bands still, but I'd hesitate to describe what they do as songwriting. Do you know what I mean? It's it's kind yeah. of riff generating almost. Now that's, so to me from a guitar standpoint, so as you're writing these songs, so let's take like a song that you wrote, you know, from going from power chords to essentially kind of gravitating towards kind of like that folk punk and making that transition playing wise. Did you feel there was like a, a period of growth and learning and like, okay, I need a different way to communicate what I'm writing. Like what I was using before doesn't necessarily work. I need to find this new form and understand my instrument a little bit differently. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's there's a, there's a bunch of stuff here. I mean, one of which is that whilst I wrote a lot of the riffs from Indian Dead, I didn't actually play guitar in that band. I mean, I, I could play guitar, but I was just the singer in the band. And, um, what, you know, we weren't the most kind of like techie band in the world, but definitely we were interested in kind of like weird bits of music and weird structure. And that was getting more so as time went by. So when I kind of, when Million Dead came to an end and I'd start hanging around in a bar in North London where there was a folk scene called Nambuka, and there was something about people standing up and just playing G, C and D that was like really startlingly kind of bold to me because I was so kind of buried in this idea of trying to complicate things and trying to make things obscurantist that's just kind of playing a song that just had open chords that everybody knows. It, this goes back to what I was saying about Weezer about it stripping everything away and only the song is left. It was like, <clears throat> almost it felt, I mean, this is an anachronistic word in a way, but it felt kind of punk to me. You know, it was like, don't hide behind a complicated drum fill and, you know, 4,000 notes a second and all the rest of it. You're going to play G, C and D and you're going to tell a story um, and there's something really raw and exposed about that. Along with that as well, I mean, I would say that what I was trying to communicate changed rather than that I needed to kind of work out new ways to communicate what I had to say. Um, in Million Dead, I kind of, I'm very, very proud of the lyrics I wrote in that band, but it was, it again, much like the music was kind of deliberately complex and obscurantist and it was kind of extended metaphors about Polish post-war communism or something, you know, and there was definitely an angle of me kind of trying to intellectually show off and all the rest of it. And when I picked up an acoustic guitar, I wanted to tell stories about my life, you know, which I hadn't really done before. Um, and that seemed to me to fit with this new format that I was playing with that was so simplistic, uh, or at least it began in a very simplistic place. Obviously, it can go to other places too. But, you know, it was like, I'm going to play GCND and I'm going to tell a story about what happened last weekend. And I'm going to tell it how it went down. And that's what I'm going to do. And, it, and it, all of this was new to me. Now, what I find interesting about your playing too. Uh, I was looking through, during quarantine, you did this series of tutorials as you broke down your songs and you mm. talked about your process. What I find, it, what makes your music too, like how fluid and so much control you have in your wrist for your right hand in strumming, mm. a lot of that communication and the dynamics and the flow that you have going on is through that right hand. Yeah, sure. And it just seems like you're very, very conscious of, you know, dynamically how you're using that. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a couple of things here. I mean, one, one of which is that, as I've been sort of saying, like a lot of my early kind of musical guitar explorations were in stuff like um, thrash and, and fast skate punk kind of stuff. And a lot of that music requires a lot of kind of right wrist control or strumming hand control, however you want to put it. And um, 
you know, I learned like linoleum by no effects or whatever. I spent hours practicing that. And then, you know, a bunch of old Pennywise riffs and indeed like Chromag stuff and Metallica stuff and all the rest of it. And, and there's a discipline in there that I think quite a lot of people in my current corner of the musical world don't tend to grow up with because they learn finger picking first or whatever. And, and that's cool. And that's great. So, um, so that, that was one thing. I, the other thing that's really um, important to stress is that like when I started my solo career, it was just me for a long time. And I always had plans to have other musicians play on the record and on stage, you know, to have a drummer and a bass player and whatever else. But um, there was something about the fact that for, for years at the beginning, the shows was just me. And what that teaches you is that if it's just you and one instrument, you have to get very good at dynamics within how you play that one instrument. Because otherwise, you know, you, ha you can't get louder by bringing in a bass part or bringing in a drum fill. You have to get louder and quieter and, and basically describe the whole dynamics of what a band would usually do with one instrument, which means you get really judicious about choosing when to play hard and when to play quiet and when to play fast and when to play slow. And, you know, concentrating quite a lot of the time I'll do One of the things that I'll do is like no, choose which strings on the of the six on the guitar to bring in at which point. So you start a song where you're just playing the bottom four strings and then you get to a pre-chorus and you bring in the B string and then you get to the chorus and you bring in the top E because the more strings that you play at the same time the more the guitar sings you know so yeah. if you take away at the beginning that leaves you somewhere to go so i was thinking about all of this stuff a lot because because i guess in my head these songs would have a full band arrangement at some point i wanted to communicate that whilst it was just me playing the guitar on my own and that like i say it makes you think about solo dynamics a lot would, would you say that's also too to me at least like a combination of a good song regardless full band or just you if it can be conveyed in a way, it's still a good song, regardless oh, of yeah. the band. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But uh, <clears throat> that's a, uh, yeah, there's a, there's the old adage that has been attributed to about 8 million people. But like, you know, <laughs> um, if you, you should be able to strip a great song down to just you and a guitar or you and a piano or whatever it might be, and it should survive in that format. Um, I, I think I broadly do subscribe to that idea. And, and certainly, you know, these days I play songs with a full band and some of those songs are written with a full band and they might be more riff based or whatever. But there's a part of me that always maintains an ability to do a version that's on my own, partly out of necessity because I still tour on my own a fair bit, you know. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, there's something kind of like conceptual in there. It's like I have to be able to pull this back to just me, um, you know, to, it, for it to be a worthwhile song. Now, when I was looking through your tutorials, what not just your right hand, but the inversions you choose to use throughout different chords. Mm. Like I think it was photosynthesis. You were breaking down. You were playing three different versions of D yeah. all in a row. And to me, that's another aspect of guitar for songwriters that it, sure. it's important kind of knowing those inversions because the yeah. colors and the textures that you get are amazing absolutely well this is it's it's kind of the same thing again about sort of wanting to make one instrument sound i mean kind of not like not necessarily like more than one instrument but just more interesting than just hammering the same three chords around and around again if you've got a song that's based around a three chord structure and there's nothing wrong with that or a four chord structure like you know learning to fly by tom petty but you can make it more interesting by you know playing a different inversion of a chord when you get to the pre-chorus and then a different one again on the chorus or whatever it might be and you can come up the neck and this is true of a lot of my songs the actual kind of root chord sequence if you like if you just write down what the actual chords are one by one is pretty simplistic but what i'll do when i'm playing it is yeah find those different positions in which to play the chords um that will contribute to the overall kind of feel and and growth and dynamic of the song so when you're when you're sitting down to write a song do you feel it's like you hash out the chords in your head as it's kind of going with the melody and from there you think about how can i then kind of add on to this, like what, you know, small little inflections kind of adds hammer outs yeah. are going to be here. Yeah. So you usually, yes. I mean, sometimes, you know, stuff arrives more fully formed than others, as I'm sure, you know, yeah, you know, <laughs> there are the, the good days are when that, when it just falls into your lap and those are few and far between. Um, but yeah, quite often, yeah, you start with something that's really kind of basic and then, and then kind of find your way to different inversions or different chordal voicings or however you want to put it. Um, and quite often, actually a thing I do quite a lot and something, um, I'm, that I have, that I'm quite good at, I think, if I can say that without sounding up my own ass. Um, like um, the way that I think about chords is is relative, is relational. I very much think about one, four, five, six, or however you want to describe it, rather than you know G, C, D, E minor. Yeah. You know, um, and what that means is it makes transposing from one key to another really easy. Um, and I kind of know, in a sort of slightly instinctual way, 
what a song in D shape sounds like versus what a song in C shape sounds like versus what a song in E shape sounds like. Certainly one of the things all those things does is it gives you different options for open strings to let ring, which is a thing I do a lot. You know, you, you'll be kind of, because again, if it's just you on a guitar, an open string resonates much more than a fretted string. So if you can find a chord voicing that allows you to let a string or two ring open at certain points, that can give you a kind of shimmer you wouldn't want to otherwise get. So quite often I'll write a song in a certain chord shape and then go, well, what would happen if I played this in C shapes rather than G shapes or, or F shapes rather than D shapes or whatever it might be. And, and in that way, you kind of find different kind of voicings um, and certain chords within a scale are easier to play in certain kind of um, keys, if you like. And of course, you can use a capo as well, or capo, as you might say, um, to, to move yourself up and down the neck if you need to, to keep the vocal melody where you want it to be. So let's say you're playing a song in C shapes with an open guitar and you're like, cool, I like how this sits with my voice and I like the chords, but, mm, you know, it, the chord chain could be different. What, what, if you put a capo on three and then start playing in A shapes, you're in the same key, but you yeah. now have a whole different array of open strings to play with, of chord voicings and chord shapes to play with. For, I mean, one of, the, one of the things in that specific example is that your root note, which is a C, is now an open A string. Do you know what I mean? Which means you yeah. can let that ring out, for example, whilst playing other things, which is a thing I do in a song called I Knew a Proof Rock Before We Got Famous. That's very much why that song is on capo three, so I can let that root note ring out through the verses so you know i think about this kind of stuff a lot i and, and what's interesting to me because i think sometimes people when they approach songwriting or with especially with guitar they get fearful of how much theory should i know how much is too much how much is crippling and i feel like what you're describing right now these are just like the core fundamentals where it's like once you get this and you start to think about yeah. some of these things the possibilities of your songwriting suddenly like increase. It's just like you're given more of a palette as opposed to just a little this little yeah. set of chords. I think I think that's true. And I mean, I I do think that first of all, there is the theory can be dangerous in the sense that it can t you can find yourself in a position where you're telling yourself what you're not allowed to do, which I think is not a brilliant instinct for a songwriter because you're allowed to do whatever the fuck you want and there is value sometimes in people who have no musical theory and Kurt Cobain's the great example who therefore come up with more interesting stuff because you kind of go oh well you know I'm in C major I shouldn't really play a, a G sharp chord and it's like well fucking play it if you want to play it you know <laughs> um so is that the, on the flip side of that I mean you know definitely like um I get the I'm, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination well versed in theory but I have a little uh, there's more than one type of theory, but, you know, so the kind of thing that I will do is like, um, for example, um, I went through a phase of being really obsessed with the dominant second chord, which is a traditional country thing. You know, let's say you're playing in G major, you play a G, a C and a D, and then you play an A7, you know, like a major A chord in there. It's a very yeah. kind of George Jones thing to do. It's kind of, and it's a, it's a, it gives you this very specific feeling. Um, and I've used that from time to time, but this is the thing. Similarly, if you're a G and then you play an F, an F major chord, there's a very specific feeling that that gives me. Um, and, and I think about theory on that level quite a lot. But as I said before, there's more than one type of theory. You know, um, Matt, who plays keys in my band, is the most incredibly well-versed guy in technical kind of classical theory, should we say. And he's constantly banging on at me about subdominance and suspended <laughs> force and some shit. And I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, but um, as I mentioned before, I tend to think more about music and chords in a kind of um, uh, relative kind of way, a relational kind of way. I had this absolutely fascinating moment in my life, and this is probably about 10 years ago now, but I was doing some shows with a band called the Water Tower Bucket Boys, who are a bluegrass band. Yeah. And um, they asked if I wanted to sit in on a song, and I sort of said, sure, thinking to myself, I'm nowhere fucking near good enough to play with these guys because they're incredible bluegrass players, but fuck it, let's give it a go. <laughs> And the, I got up onto the stage, it was during soundcheck, and I was like, so what are we doing here? And the, the guy turned to me and he said, oh, capo four, C shapes, one, four, five, six, or whatever it was he said. And I was like, oh my God, that's how I think <laughs> about chords. And I've never heard anyone else call them like that. Now, of course they do. And in fact, it's, yeah. quite, it's quite a trad kind of blues and folk and bluegrass kind of way of calling chords. But I'd sort of figured that out on my own and wasn't aware that anybody else thought like that. Um, but this is the thing, you know, there are different traditions in terms of music and music theory, you know, um, uh, and funnily enough, my cousin is a trained classical concert pianist and there, I've had moments in my life, you know, and she can play Rachmaninoff and shit, but my God, she can't jam, jam, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, and I, I, I've said to her like, hey, we're in A major, we're just going to play like, you know, yeah, one, 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 five, six, two or whatever. And she's like, what does that mean? <laughs> and, and I'm like... This is so much easier than what you do, but it's not how she's been trained. 
you know, um, she's especially she's, through that lens where it's just like you have something that's a very professional and, you know, kind of like one extreme or perfect, you know, concert pianist. And it's just like, hey, it's just play. I've had people that have gone to music school and they've been well versed and they're just like, what exactly do you want me to play? And I'm like, well, we're right. just staying within this. What exactly? They want very specific right. guidelines, guidelines. Yeah, completely. I guess so. so uh, you know, the, from uh, if I may be so bold, like our approach to music is more kind of improvisational at its heart. You know, a lot of yeah. classical musicians come to improvisation, but it's a kind of latter period skill. Whereas I think that for the way that I play, it's right at the beginning of it is improvisation, which is incidentally something that is at the core of songwriting in the sense that, like, you know, I often get asked the question about, like, you know, how do you write songs and all the rest of it? And um, there is a level on which the answer to that question is fuck around until you find something cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, or even to be slightly more highfalutin, but not much about it. Like the way that I, I write would, songs. I would totally get that crocheted on a pillow. I just yeah. love that. <laughs> Fuck around until you find something that works. Um, <laughs> similarly, like, you know, one of the ways I write songs is I think, what if there was a song that was about this and felt like that? That'd be cool. And then I try and write it. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's sort of like, you. it's like, imagine a song that made you feel like this. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to write it. You know, and, and you sort of start with how it will feel when it's done before you've got anything, really, you know. But I feel, that, you know, that is what makes, you know, a, a songwriter, maybe a separation from someone that is thinking classically trained in this way. Mm. But like, how does this make me feel? You know, what yeah. am I trying to convey? And it's like the set of chords you choose, the inversions, all of that is this perfect, uh, you know, marriage between all of that that ends up driving home your lyric even more or your melody. Oh yeah, totally. And like, I mean, I think that I think that at the heart of songwriting, there's something really kind of ephemeral in a way that I think is good. Like, there's a you can talk about the technicalities of it until the cows come home, uh, and I enjoy doing that. But like, there is a bit right at the middle of it that is kind of you can't quite look at directly, if you see what I mean. And I think that's really good. There is still magic at the heart of it, and there always will be. Um, you know, and like, and and part of that magic is how it is that sound and words relate to each other. And I don't think that I or anyone really has the kind of vocabulary to really get into that. And again, I think that's good. I think that, you know, in, in a way, trying to dissect it too much um, uh, is dangerous because it, it, it'll, it'll kill it. But I mean, let me pick a specific example of what I'm talking about here. One of my favorite songs of all time is Rambling Man by the Allman Brothers. I don't know yeah. if you know that tune. And there's, there is a section in that song where he goes, when it's time for leaving... Uh, my day will surely come, whatever it is, but it's that when it's time for leaving, and it's something about the combination of the way the chords change under it, the way that the notes fall, and the what in the vo in the voice, and the w fact that the line is when it's time for leaving. Something in the combination of those three makes me want to cry, and I couldn't fucking tell you why, and I will never be able to tell you why. But what I will do is play that to myself over and over and over again. <sighs> Because it does something to you. And it's just like, it's just right. like, that's the beauty of it. And that's, ah, uh, that is so good. Um, one question, you know, I'm, I'm very curious too on the process of taking someone else's song and turning it into your style. Like you, you've just released um, a split with no effects. Yeah. Uh, West Coast versus, versus Wessex. And, you know, the, for instance, a song like Perfect Government, which I remember Punk and Drublick, you know, mm -hmm. learning that song. You mentioned Linoleum. And I remember, you know, killing my wrist trying to get that timing right at the very beginning. Yeah. But like, how, what was the process of taking their song and being like, okay, how am I going to turn this into my own if I were to write this? Yeah, that, that's kind of part of it. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's, it's, it is a slightly different process. And it, well, I'll come back to this in a minute. It's a very useful one as a songwriter to apply to yourself. But anyway, so the point is, you've got this one guide rail when you're doing this, which is don't do what the original does, because there's no fucking point. You know, if you're just going to repeat what the original does, someone can just go and list the original. They might as well do that. Um, so what you're trying to do is anything except that. But at the same time, hopefully not just for the sake of it do you know what i mean you don't want to just be like yeah. well he plays it this way i'm going to play it this way because that's different you want you've got to justify it you know and and so within that it's about kind of trying to find an angle on the song emotionally melodically musically rhythmically structurally whatever it might be that feels like it's hidden in the original but hasn't kind of come to full bloom you know what i mean so you're kind of digging around in there trying to trying to find something new and kind of different to add to to bring out of the song you're working with the same source material you're working with the basic structure of the song the roadmap the blueprint which is a set of kind of as i say brute chords and and top line melody and and lyrics and it's like cool how do i 
present this in a different way. The, the archetypal example for me is a little help with my friends, um, the Joe Cocker version of that, which yeah. is just a staggering reimagination of the original. And I think it's better than the original, and that's not to disrespect the Beatles in any way, because they're the fucking Beatles. But do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> like you know, if, if I'm trying to explain to, to a younger person or somebody who's just getting involved with songwriting how different a song can be in terms of how you come at it arrangement-wise, and it, almost in a way how arrangement is a separate uh, or, and complementary art to songwriting, just play those two songs back to back. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's unbelievable how intense it is the difference between the two so um you know so to come back to what i was mentioning earlier one of the things i actually do a lot and sort of have learned to do through my career and nowadays do a lot is if i i will quite often finish a song for myself when i'm writing and get to a place where i'm happy with it and kind of i mean again not just for the sake of it i will then almost like try and cover my own song imagine someone else write it wrote it and then yeah. how would i come at this completely differently because you never know in doing that you might actually find a better way of playing it you know um and it's a it's a good discipline can you find any songs in your head where you did that and it was just like you you like covered your own and you were like shit this is like oh yeah i'm gonna um, do this yeah completely i mean um in particular on the last kind of uh full band studio record i did be more mm -hmm. kind that was almost kind of at the very heart of the writing process for that record i mean there's, there's a song on that called brave face which went through about nine different iterations before we ended up on the record and in on all honesty i'm not 100 percent convinced we picked the right one we did slightly reach the point where it was like i can't tell anymore um <laughs> you know what i mean but like you know little changes went through a lot of different iterations and in fact we just worked out a whole new one the other day in rehearsal and that's cool and we'll play that live and that'll be really fun because the core of the song remains the same you know so you can play it and people will know what the song is and they'll be able to sing along with it but the presentation will be very different um so yeah and speaking of that you just played your 2500 shows yeah right this sunday you had that is crazy yeah it's quite a few huh that that is quite a lot you know <laughs> looking you know it, with that amount of shows the things that you were talking about, do you find yourself going back to songs and like re-envisioning them, you know, for a live set and thinking like, how can I approach this differently? And it's like a fresh perspective. And you're like, I'm, I'm more in love with this song now. Yeah, I, th I think sometimes I will do that as consciously as you're describing. Um, yeah. But at the same time, the other thing that happens, I think it's really important to say that I regard there's something about the art of recording that's quite artificial. And the, the, the traditional metaphor is pinning, pinning a butterfly. You know what I mean? It's like um, a song is an organic creation that continues to grow and breathe. So the example I'm thinking of specifically here, although this applies to many different songs, but like the song I have photosynthesis, the way that we play that live is radically different to how it is on the record. And at no point did I or anybody else set about changing it. It's just that we played that song at every fucking show since 2007. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like yeah. over a 13 year period, of course, it's going to grow and little kind of just inflections come in on the drums or on the bass part might move or my guitar part changes. And the other day I was doing a, a thing of like playing along with the original recording for a guitar tutorial website or some shit. And like, I kind of almost couldn't play along with it, or at least I had to have like practice before I could nail it because it was like, what the fuck is that? What am I doing? Um, you know, and, and I had to really think back to it, but even that in itself was kind of a cool process because there were some bits where I was like, Oh, that's really good. I should actually bring that back in again. You know, um, as I say, there are times when I'll pick a song and like quite deliberately try and find a new version of it. But all the way through, songs tend to kind of grow and breathe and 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 develop and everything else. And I think that's really cool. But twenty five hundred shows—that's amazing. You know, it, during that time, can you think back to memorable shows that you felt like that was? I can't recapture that feeling. I mean, yeah, there's there's a few, you know, <laughs> as you might expect. Um, uh, and at the risk of sounding like a salesman at this point, I actually I, I went through the first 1,500 or so and wrote down my favorite ones and put them in a book. So uh, there there is a book of tour stories from that. But, um, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I think that I've done so many that it's very difficult to pick individual ones. But, like, yeah. the second thing I would say is that they keep coming, as, it, as in the memorable moments keep coming. This is with talking about the business of my adult life here but like for example in january this year i played one of the absolute hands down craziest shows of my life which is i was the opening act for a uh street gangster rap battle in a car park in sierra leone of like homeless street gangsters with having a rap battle and i was the opening act uh standing on like a bunch of beer crates 
in, in a car park in the slums of one of the poorest cities in the world. Um, and there's a story as to why I was there, which is there's a charity out there, a music charity out there that I work with, and I've worked with a lot of the artists in time. But nevertheless, I stood there and thought, what the living shit am I doing here? Um, and, you know, felt incredibly kind of privileged and white and middle class and Western and all the rest of it. Um, but it was incredible. Everyone had a good time. But, you know, it's like, I'm not, you sit there and you think to yourself, what decisions did I take at what point that have led to this? Um, <laughs> And, and I suppose, <laughs> how can I make more of them? Oh, that is, that's wonderful. Uh, y- you are very involved in, I, I saw a post that you made, um, we make events. You're very, yeah. you're, you're very vocal in making sure that people realize that, hey, right now COVID is hit and you have a music industry and you have a group of folks that are vital to live music. Yeah. I, I mean, and, I am first and foremost a live performer, just if, in terms of where I make yeah. my living and what I spend the vast majority of my time doing. And, of course, in terms of what I love. I absolutely love touring. It's my favorite thing. Um, the, the, you know, in the public perception, there's kind of quite clear distinctions in the touring world. There's the musicians and then there's the crew and all the rest of it. Once you're living on a tour bus with people, those distinctions are meaningless. Do you know what I mean? It's just <laughs> like you're all in the gang together. You're living in a stinking dormitory on wheels. Like there's, there's no one's more important than anybody else. You know what I mean? And like, um, you know, as, as was said, actually, at the event that I did last night, which I thought was really well put, it's like the thing about the crew is they're people whose job description most of the time is to not be seen. That's kind of the idea. You know what I mean? You stay the fuck out of sight. You keep off the stage and all the rest of it. We're now at a point in time where pe- those people need to be seen because they are suffering enormously. And I think a lot of people who come to shows don't know quite how many people with quite that level of expertise are required to make the show happen. That, and, and it's true. And I think when people realize that, the importance of live music and the importance of those that are involved in making it happen, the unseen and the people that make it run, they're extremely vital to the health of live music. Absolutely. The future of it. Well, totally. And I mean, I don't, you know, obviously it's different in different parts of the world. In the UK, I was, I started off being involved in a big campaign to save independent music venues that went very well and the government has earmarked some money for it and all the rest of it. But, you know, now we need to talk about the support infrastructure for the music industry. Otherwise, and this was one of my lines from last night, but otherwise we're just going to end up with a bunch of artists, dickheads, wandering aimlessly around empty rooms. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. there, there is more that needs to happen for there to be a show. And in fact, I played some songs last night, and I honestly didn't plan this, but it was glorious. My guitar strap broke during a song, and I just looked like a prize idiot. And I just <laughs> kind of went, well, guys, that, my tech isn't here because, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and therefore I look like a fucking dickhead, and I actually need my tech to be here. I, I think that's also for a lot of people that are like, I've experienced that too. But to hear you say, like, my strap broke, and I was like, well, fuck. You know, <laughs> that is... the best of us. It, it, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the one thing I, I, I'd love to know, too, when you find yourself, you know, in this period of, like, quarantine, and, you know, you're, you know, how did you find inspiration? You know, were there songs, were you writing? Were you kind of, like, staying inspired? How were you staying, I guess, grounded during a time like this? Uh, well, so, um, the first thing is like one of my sort of task I had set myself this year anyway, before there was a pandemic on the horizon was to finish writing songs for what will be my next studio album, my ninth record. And I had a bunch of stuff in the bag already, but I was thinking to myself, you know, I I think I had like 12 down. I wanted to get to maybe like 15, should we say before going in to make a record. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And then, um, I think it's funny. A lot of people talk about lockdown as if it's this like monolithic and, experience you know it's like it's been hugely varied for me at the beginning it was like a crisis i had to come home from a tour then i had this moment of being a bit zen and kind of say well you know now i've got this kind of um this time to be uh still and quiet and focus on writing and no distractions and then i realized that there was this one distraction which was the fucking global pandemic (laughs) um do you know what i mean which is not inconsiderable um And, uh, you know, and then I went through that phase, which I think every artist has done of writing a whole bunch of lockdown songs. Um, I have a bit of a theory. There's going to be a glut of lockdown songs quite soon. Uh, and I'm not sure how many the world needs. I've written my fair share. Some of them already feel pretty dated, which is a crazy thing to say about songs I wrote in the last like three, four months. Um, uh, and how many of those will actually make a record, I guess we'll see, but I'm up to like 25 songs now. Do you know what I mean? I've, 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 yeah. I have found time. This is the thing. Like, in a way, almost because this is so all-encompassing, this global pandemic thing, I want to write about something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it seems important to focus on other things where possible. But at the same time, it's quite hard to do that because holy fucking shit, what's going on? 
it's a global pandemic and it's uh, like we it's just like what the fuck it's like spanish flu here in america we remembered Spanish, and that's it that's the only thing we have to compare right totally and, and, and over here too and i mean it's it's very 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 strange and i still now i keep waking up in the mornings and remembering what's going on and going jesus christ you know what i mean it's, <laughs> it's weird um, Frank, I, I want to thank you for, uh, spending time here, sharing your perspective and songwriting. It's been, uh, it, wonderful. And thank you so much for just taking a chunk of time to talk about your process. It's an absolute pleasure. I, I, I love getting this deep into the technical side of things. So thank you for letting me sound off like that. When I sound off like that to my wife, she tells me I'm being boring. So thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Frank. I can't tell you how much I loved having that conversation with Frank because he was so generous with his time and afterwards being like, I, I enjoy talking technique. I don't get to talk a lot about this. So the fact that we got to do this is amazing. Now, one thing Frank and I talked a lot about, strumming and dynamics. This seems to be the one thing I always see clients and other singer-songwriters get hung up on. They get confused or they feel they have a limited vocabulary, essentially. So if you go to songwritingforguitar.com, there are some free resources you can check out. I have a three-day strumming boot camp, which is going to give you different patterns to choose from so you don't feel limited. And then finally, I have audience-engaging dynamics. So when you're trying to vary your song, especially your sections, they just feel flat. Flat. You need to understand dynamics. Now, if you listen to Frank's songs, that's what it has. That's what's engaging you because he understands that principle. So songwritingforguitar.com, two free resources that you can check out. I want your songs to be kick-ass. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes and leave us an amazing review. That would be much appreciated. This episode was edited and produced by Chris Fafalius. Until next time. <laughs>